And we're back. This is episode 470 of the Columbia Calling podcast. As I mentioned in segment one, our very special guest this week comes from a literary background. In fact, she's a literary translator. She's in France right now. But we're going to be talking about the book she's translated that has just come out, I believe on May the 11th, it was uh, released. It's called This Wound of Fish, and it's by a Colombian author called Lorena Salazar Masso. It's a fascinating read. It's a fascinating read. It's a very atmospheric read. Uh, it's based in the Choco, but due to sort of language issues and so on, we're going to talk to the translator, Annie McDermott, and we're going to talk about her experiences in Colombia, and we're going to talk about the book in its uh, in itself, in its entirety. So, Annie, welcome on the Columbia Calling podcast. Thank you. Thanks for having me. It's an enormous pleasure, and I was told, you see, I got an email out of the blue by the uh, uh, publishing house uh saying you know would you would you like to promote this book it's been you know we've we've got it on our things i said well yeah i'm always interested anything columbia related is of interest to me and books even more so I, a voracious reader uh so i you know sent back and i guess we found out that lorena's english is not you know up she didn't feel confident about it but i said well let's talk to annie the translator and latterly they said frankie there in that office said she knows the podcast so that <laughs> puts you in great <laughs> steed uh, and a great standing with me. And I understand that in 2019, you spent three months in Colombia. Yeah, I did. In the summer to autumn of 2019, I was traveling around. And that was when I started listening to Colombia Calling as a way of both learning about the country and distracting myself from the very treacherous long bus journeys that I was taking about the place. And so, yeah, I started listening to the podcast. Then. So you, I mean, you were pre-pandemic as well, This is, which is, yeah. it was, and Colombia was booming. I mean, that summer, that that period, we were, it was our best ever period in tourism. And I also am going to get her out there. She did not stay in my hotel in Montpos. So that, you know, knocks her a, a little <laughs> bit on the standings. But at the same time, she was in Montpos and she traveled around. And I can tell you that since 2019, the roads are still treacherous, the landslides are still occurring, and the accessibility does not appear to have improved because we've had a lot of cancellations of airlines and flights and so on. So even that side of things has worsened, which kind of takes us to the book a bit because we address, well, addressed in this book, the this wound of fish, uh, it's based in Choco. And accessibility is of a key element all the way through because you've got to get to Kibdo and Kibdo is the first location in the book but I you didn't make it to Choco because again accessibility and cost yeah it was a tough decision I was find I found it very kind of fascinating the very idea of this region of Colombia that was so inaccessible and that has such a particular culture which is so which is so it's a region where there's um a lot of the Afro-Colombian population lives, but also a lot of indigenous culture in this kind of amazing melting pot, which makes it sound completely fascinating. And we were really, we thought very hard about whether we'd be able to make it, but it just seemed quite a lot too difficult and also slightly dangerous at that time. We shared a taxi with a enthusiastic fisherman who said that he often goes to Choco to go on big fishing trips and that he'd stopped recently because the violence had been increasing around the summer of 2019 so that kind of yeah it, it was an issue it's, so. it's an issue because that river well of course part of it the accessibility of the department means that it's almost there's no state presence in in a lot of it uh you know just in sort of the, the main cities and the main uh, and then you've got the Atrato River, which is dealt with in the book. It's the, uh, amongst some people, it's known as like the cocaine superhighway that runs up to Urabá and out. And so therefore, it's very strategic for the armed groups. And in that vacuum that took place after 2016 and the peace accords, so it was being, it is being, there's a jostle for a complete power between the ELN, so the second, now the first guerrilla group, the National Liberation Army, and of course the Clan del Golfo, so sort of offshoot uh, of the paramilitary groups, delinquents, criminal <laughs> organization, again. But 
So what is most exciting to me, Annie, is that you've been to Colombia and you have soaked up the atmosphere and you've talked to people, obviously, who know the Choco. And this mm -hmm. has given you a background with which to approach. But perhaps it might have been a benefit knowing Colombia, but not knowing the Choco coming to the book, because the descriptions, they are very, I mean, they are, they evoke Choco very uh, profoundly. And, and I think you must have had to have had, well, I go into this, how do I translate this to get it into that, the language, into that ambience? So, I mean, were you and Lorena very much in contact about this? When she, she if she saw a translation, no, that's not the word. That's not what we're trying to say. How was your communication to, to, uh, to describe Choco? How, how did that come through? So the communication, I was quite in touch with her, I guess, especially towards the end of the translation. Normally, as I work through a translation, I build up a yeah. ever lengthening list of questions to ask <laughs> to ask the author and so towards the end I sent Lorena quite a long list of questions which some of which were about quite particular kind of very choco specific terminology mm. that even Google couldn't really <laughs> help me out with um, and then some of it was also maybe about the possibility of adding what translators call a kind of stealth gloss to the text so if you want to kind of perhaps include a word in the original Spanish or just include a word that people outside Colombia won't necessarily mm. know what the meaning is rather than including a footnote, for example, which is quite like, which translators aren't very into at the moment because it's quite unfashionable in the translation world to have too many footnotes. You might want to just include a kind of a few words in the text to give the reader a bit of a, a bit of a hint about what's uh, going on. That's interesting. So, I, you know, in a literary book, I wouldn't want to see a footnote, uh, fashion or not. In an academic book, a more academic, I'd have no issue with it, you know. Oh, yeah, or absolutely. A political, even a political journal, I don't mind a, uh, you know, a footnote. Uh, but, or, you know, footnotes, a long footnotes or index in the back. But this is, this is literature. I would prefer not to have, you know, an asterisk and then go down and see. <laughs> so what is your stealth gloss? What did you have to look at? I mean, there are so many different, so um, just trying to think, there's the, um, the really silly one occurs to me, which is just the animal paca, for example, which that is the word in English as well. But I think if you said that to a, if you just included that, a English speaking reader might think it was just a misprint of an alpaca or something. So I have where there's a paca in a cage, I have a furry white spotted paca in a cage just to give like a bit of a, <laughs> a bit of an image of what we're dealing with but i think that's fine there um, was another animal wasn't there as well that you translated and it, i came across i read it twice because i and i can't remember what it was i sh should have noted it down but i can't remember what it was and i was like what <laughs> so yeah i probably knew it better in spanish than in english but then that's yeah <laughs> this is sometimes what happens um but yeah lots of the foods lots of mm. lots of fruit lots of vegetables and then yeah, I forget exactly what I did, but quite a lot of the kind of, there was a kind of interesting balance to find in terms of what's unspoken in the book and what has to remain unspoken in relation to the armed conflict mm. itself, because it would change the book completely to over explain that stuff in the mm. translation. But at the same time, if what you want is for your readers to have a similar experience to people reading it in Spanish, you want them to sort of, mm. to pick up on the clues. Yeah even if, but you want them to still just be hints. Well, I think that is one of the key points. It's what has not, is not said in the book. And that's something that really, it it's very evident all the way through. And I think it would be evident to a non, let's say a non-Columbia reader. I think so. It's that you don't, because I did, I found myself not wanting so much to be explained because as as we can feel through the book, there is a rising tension. And if I'm not mistaken, the first several uh, chapters, although there are, uh, you know, kind of large reflections to an earlier time in it. So it sort of reminds me a bit of Francois Mauriac <laughs> a bit in that mm -hmm. one. The, the book in question I'm thinking of is, is Therese Desquerou, but it goes back to the past to explain things. 
but again it doesn't reveal too much but the first few chapters are very much a canoe ride you know a motorized canoe and therefore to me it's a an embrace of the river as the environment as everything and that first chapter sets the scene between why the Atrato River is so different from let's say the Cauca or the Magdalena uh, and there's some descriptions in there saying you know the gray of the Atrato I think it is not like that yeah, which then, yeah. and immediately sets it apart doesn't it yeah it's amazing sometimes gray sometimes cinnamon brown I think yeah, yeah. I, that for me was very special because you really were putting a distance between the rest of Colombia and this and but uh I mean you know, you've done so a, a dozen or so books, uh, Spanish, Portuguese to English. How does this compare to others that you've done? I mean, how does this compare? Is, is there anything from a similar isolation, I would say? Yeah, and I think, I think it's sort of, I think one thing that really sets this book apart and what made me so interested in translating it is actually the the prose itself, when I kind of, when I think about the way Lorena describes, describes this river, describes this landscape, it's so, it's just so lush, it's so luscious, kind of in the way that vegetation is lush, mm -hmm. her writing, kind of very like, very full, very abundant, very kind of, very sensuous, all these different tones of green, all these different kind of, yes, like sounds and smells, and all of these kind of, all of these amazing images the river's so kind of shape-shifting throughout this book so it becomes it becomes an arm of black earth it becomes a tiger that's a tiger that could swallow them whole at any moment it becomes like the title a wound full of fish it's so and I think that's what makes the book really stand out this very particular kind of like this very particular identification of the prose with the landscape that it's describing and I think that does I feel like there are parallels to that in other books that I've translated but maybe in an almost opposing way like I translate a fair few books by an Argentinian writer called Selva Almada mm -hmm. who whose books take place in this very very dry very dusty landscape in the north in the um in a Chaco yeah. <laughs> as opposed to Choco um and her prose is very, very sparse and very stripped back and very kind of like sort of, yeah, bound up in the landscape in a completely different way. So this feels like a kind of interesting counterpart to that, I think, as a translation project. But I think, you know, if you've got a counterpart that's so extreme, that helps you, isn't it? It helps you you because you I mean, the Choco is is total abundance. I mean, that's that's yeah. it, isn't it? It's and, and the earth provides the river provides and then the population provide. And that's one other thing. You notice that there is a kinship between the principal character, her son, and then, of course, just the people met on the mm -hmm. on the motorized canoe. There is immediately a, a degree of, I wouldn't say amiability, and I wouldn't say it's it's for survival. There's just a different culture. Uh, and 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 that was very impacting so i think you know i if if i can say out loud here that three of the main sort of tenets of the book are identity race and place would i be on on point yeah i think these are all things that are completely central central yeah. to the book yeah Oh, good. I'm glad because in my English <laughs> literature and French and Spanish <laughs> literature courses uh, at uh, my undergrad have been worthwhile. Yes, <laughs> all those been years ago. All <laughs> those years ago. Now, how did you feel? I mean, you know, they start in Kibdo, and there is really the again the description of a frontier city, and Kibdo mm -hmm. does have that chaos, and it is a frontier city, and it has the culture of San Pacho and San Paulo, and you know, there's this descriptions of the port and the brothels, you know, not opening their doors at a certain hour and so on. But it's just like, it, the whole town is a port. I mean, the whole town is defined by, mm -hmm. by the river. And what I found very interesting, again, is the absence. I mean, they're there, suggested, but there is an absence of male characters. 
um, the principal ones or the ones mainly written about are, are women. So, I mean, can you, can you delve into that a little bit? Yeah, I think it's a really interesting, an interesting sort of thing about this book, the fact that I guess there are two, there are two sides to it, to the kind of centrality of the female characters. And one is a kind of a deliberate choice on the part of Lorena that to place her focus upon kind of women and the lives of women during during this time in Colombian history, during during a conflict, kind of what it's like getting on with the everyday business of living when there's an armed conflict going on around you. So what it's like kind of cooking the meals, raising children, kind of, you know, watching the children while they play in the street, making sure they come back in before dark, all this kind of, just this kind of, this side of life, which I think she's making a very particular decision to focus on in the book and to give a different, a different perspective on this period of Columbia's history. But then I think also it's, it's at points in the book, it's a simple reflection of how life was. So when she reaches Bella Vista and she's, um, and she's spending time with the her adopted son's biological mother, and they're talking about what's happened to her other children. And her male ch children have been taken off by armed groups, and that's the end of that. Like, there's a reason why. There's also a reason why women are so central to this book, and it's because the men are elsewhere, whether or not they want to be. And I think this is one of the one of the big conversations taking place is that you know the the one of the. The, the some of the principal victims of the of the of the armed conflict are, are of course women uh the ones who are left to maintain the home the children the income the f the food and, and and so on or left alone at the end and yeah without going into that so more i think that that is a, a you know very key because it does seem like they're just there are women and and then that that tragedy of Rossi, uh, mm -hmm. Rossi, who is pregnant on the boat and 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 loses the child, and then you know obviously has uh, bleeds out from lack of uh, real um, medical attention, and it's it's this. I I I feel, and I think that you had to obviously you had to you had to explore this as well in the translation. It's the it is the, a loss of life is a very it's, I wouldn't say mundane, but it's very it's 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 it, it's very ever present in in, mm -hmm. in in the region and in the book. Uh, but it's not. There are two. There are two periods in the book which are particularly shocking. One is Rossi, the other is towards the end. But we're not going to talk about it because you all have to read the book. Uh, mm -hmm. One is at the end, and and yet those feel impacting. But death is a constant, isn't it? Yeah, it's a constant presence and it just, I mean, I think, again, without without speaking too much about the ending, which should definitely not be kind <laughs> of revealed to people who haven't read the book, I think, I think a real difference between, maybe a real difference in the experience for readers, Colombian readers of this book and readers in the UK or in the US is, is this relationship with death. Like, I think mm. there's, even when I was reading it, I found myself thinking, oh, this is really like, this is really brutal. This is really mm. awful. This is almost too much. And then when you read about the history of Colombia, you think, no, this is this is everyday mm. reality. This isn't at all over the top. This is a reflection rather than a kind of melodramatic reconstruction of it. So I think I find that quite an interesting reminder that just the texture of, yeah, I think the texture I, of these things is so different. I think you're right. And that, I mean, it's it's so it's so ordinary i would say along mm -hmm. it and it's impact you know and again the friend in in the town saying oh yeah you know well the friend the 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 birth mother saying well no they were taken off the men mm -hmm. took them and then they were killed trying to escape and you're just like and that's it there's no tears there's no uh there are no words of sympathy there's no conversation it's not developed in that way it's it's almost matter of fact yeah, I think that's right. I think there's something very, there's just this constant sense that, yeah, I think matter of fact is right, that you have to kind of get on with, get on with the business of living yeah, as yeah. well. And, and I think while it is a genuinely Choco 
centric book, I do think that kind of thing could be transposed anywhere in Colombia, a small town in the Montes de Maria, up in Cordoba or in the Cauca or where else. I think that is is one of the elements, isn't it, that could be. I mean, it, when you traveled around, did you get into any areas which you thought, oh, they've really suffered here? Absolutely. I think, I mean, that's that's something that's really present in so much of Colombia. I mean, the yeah, the conflicts sort of in the very recent past and also not entirely really concluded. So I think you're really aware of that um, the whole time. And just, I have very vivid memories of standing in all sorts of different places in Colombia, looking at the jungle and just think, just thinking how it would have, how it would have seemed. It's not just kind of, oh, the natural world, this place that's so separate, but a place that's so full of kind of hidden forces and kind of people and, goings on and just how sinister and unknown this kind of landscape that surrounds the places that you live would have seemed mm. like which I think is something that's really present throughout the book as they're driving driving as they're okay. sailing down the <laughs> sailing down the river and just looking at what looks like sort of trees and undergrowth and vegetation but knowing that it's not mm -hmm. just that that out of sight within that there's so much going on that's that they're constantly vulnerable to and that they're constantly kind of yeah enthralled to without even being able to see it and i think yeah i think that really... you're light on that this the word sinister is very good because there is it's not something uh overwhelmingly discussed here the uh, this this issue of being sinister and the 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 forces and we're not talking about armed forces i, th I think we're talking about a certain mysticism that includes uh, includes the conflict but also includes the the natural world when you say sinister and you we, okay we're looking at a, 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 a what could be a paradise and there is that point where they stop i think they stop is it to go and try and get some food and yet the quote is no there's nothing here those people took uh th those people took the food and in, in a shop mm -hmm. in the middle of nowhere you know these i mean a riverside uh dock basically and it's like no those people took it and then that's it again so you you end up if i'm if i'm not mistaken rereading those points just to remind yourself of what's going on but you said something about driving and there is there is driving <laughs> at some point mm -hmm. in the book also. and i <laughs> and i wanted to read a quote and later on you'll read a read us an excerpt from the book so so people can get a style but i wanted to read you a, a quote that i that, there's a couple that impacted me and one was we're no longer so squashed in the back of this red willies which is lopsided like the smile of a lonely old man and as yeah. wow <laughs> you know the <laughs> willies are the world war ii era jeeps that are used all over colombia for the four by fours and they're totally indestructible and if anyone's seen any sort of uh, i would say um tourism pamphlets there'll be a willies on it you know maybe a red mm -hmm. one with bananas and coffee and whatever else stacked on top but to have described it as lopsided like the smile of a lonely old man seems so unusual but then so correct at the same time are there moments then when you get to something like that and translate it and you stop and you smile absolutely like that's and it's moments like that that are just just a gift if you're a translator because <laughs> it's it just sort of sounds so amazing in English as well without you even really necessarily <laughs> having to kind of um think too much about it and I think there's something this book's so full of moments like that partly because it's a book which is so permeated by the kind of the childish the child's world view both of her son when she's seeing the world both as she sees it and as he sees it and when she's kind of all along this journey she's having to make up games to entertain mm. him or find ways of explaining what's happening that will make sense to him without mm. frightening him or being too honest but also and then there's also her kind of flashbacks to when she's a child and so all through this as you say very sinister book there's a kind of parallel view or vision of the world around which is kind of childlike in that kind of not necessarily innocent or mm. but just that kind of childlike logic where you make slightly different connections to the connections made by an adult or where you're kind of 
just operating on a slightly where you have different priorities, different things are interesting to you. Like the names of the plums that you're eating yes. might be more interesting to you than <laughs> sort of, you know, any armed men sailing by. So I, I think there's that childlike view. She, she does create a shield, doesn't she, for him? But she doesn't, I wouldn't say she's, she doesn't uh, sugarcoat it. There is a shield, but at the same time, it's like he's still young. But there is a reality here. And, you, you know, there's that quote as well. Uh, and I'll get to that. I'll read the quote here. I've got it. And it, we go back to Rossi a bit. And I wondered how she would explain or would she just kind of ignore the 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 reference to Rossi dying? Would she tell her son? And I think she doesn't tell him because I think it's an internal an internal commentary where she says, meeting Rossi just before she died makes her a part of my future, even though she's no longer here. Maybe I'll visit her with some real flowers when I get back to Kibdo. And I think that was internally said, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. So that's not actually said to the boy. But mm. then he does know what's happened. But you kind of realise that he knows what's happened at that slightly, like, both sad and amazing moment where the day after, um, the morning after the, um, yeah, the morning after her funeral, the vigil, um, mm. there's music and the boy suddenly starts dancing and he's just having this amazing time dancing and the woman's thinking, I didn't teach him how to dance like that. How did he <laughs> learn this? And then in the end, after this kind of real like cathartic scene of sort of movement and music, he lies down in the middle of the floor where Rossi's body had been the night before. And he says, Ma, I'm dead from dancing so much. So he sort of, he's, he's saying it and he knows it's happened, but a, a, as a kind of, as a kind of joke or as not, it's sort of what, on what level has he taken it in or how is he processing it? It's kind of a, that's an exactly kind of, exactly what I mean about this kind mm -hmm. of, parallel childlike child's kind of child's eye view of what's going on because he mm. is processing it he's taking it in he's thinking about it but just not in the same way as the adult characters are and then, then there's that force as well of the earth and being connected to it and again it comes back it's through everything but before we get a little bit further on there's one other thing that i wanted to discuss just jumping around a bit and i and i think it's a colombian thing <laughs> And I wanted to know if it's something that you experienced or you felt that it's a Colombian thing. Is like the the conversation between uh, you know, let's say the main uh, main character and then the 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 new friend on on the boat. It's it's intrusive in my mind. You know, I, I again Northern European would prefer not to share uh, all of my <laughs> you know private the private workings in my family, but of course. You know, there's an in, there's an intrusive nature of the questions, and I just think that the private is very much in the public domain. And and and, and how would you, after your experiences in Colombia, do you feel that this is something that runs through the country, or is it is it something that says what's more, it's it's more based in that region or uh, elsewhere? Yeah, it's a tough question. I mean, in the context. In the context of the book, I think it's so it's fascinating because of kind of what this what this boat ride mm. become this boat ride makes it sound so frivolous, oh, but yeah. what this boat journey becomes. It's such a mm. kind of microcosm of the kind of like this image of this group of people who are just trying to like get where they need to go and they're just going on this single journey in this down this river. That's just one aim, which is just get to the end of the journey and yet there are all of these different kind of potential risks and dangers lurking on either side. And I think that's such a, it feels like such a kind of metaphor for just mm. what, what it feels like to be trying to just get, get through, get by. Get um, by. And but I think that then the world of the boat somehow becomes their, their whole lives sort of begin to take place around each other like privacy does become different because everybody can hear each other's conversations everyone becomes part of all of the different kind of health things that happen to each other or all the different conversations all that's all these different things all the kind of if you're singing everyone's listening like mm. somehow everyone's it's such a shared experience that I think privacy does become something a bit different 
and it starts to feel quite like I think early on in her sort of friendship and this is an example of what you're talking about because it does kind of become a friendship between mm. the protagonist and Carmen Emilia the woman sitting next to her but early on it does feel quite surprising and maybe intrusive and just quite bold the way she's asking these direct questions but mm. really quickly it starts to make perfect sense and it just mm. seems like the most natural thing in the world because just I think boundaries are different when you're in that sort of situation I, I think so I, I think so and I think again there's that connection through through everything and I it makes me think is you know the very first time I I traveled to Montpost the bus broke down <laughs> mm -hmm. surprise surprise and I was the the sole uh, foreigner visitor on the bus and everybody wanted to talk and you know we were standing in the sunlight not a tree uh, to offer shade not a tienda there's always a tienda somewhere where you can <laughs> buy a drink from at this point there wasn't and you know the people started making sort of funny declarations nearby to therefore I guess break down the barriers to talk with me. Yeah, so I heard one guy further up in the bus, sort of four or five rows, going, "Ah, you know, the gringos can put a man on the moon, and we can't even get a bus tire down there." And you knew that this was a way of uh, of bringing the conversation in and including me. So I thought, "Yeah, you know." And by the end of it, they knew who I was, what I was doing how much family I had um, <laughs> and everything else. I mean, that was it. It was, just, but it was that interesting thing. So, you know, everyone is in that same uh, situation. I'm not going to say everyone's in that same boat. Uh, everyone's in that <laughs> same situation. So before we get to you uh, reading an extract, I just want to say, you know, to the, to the listeners out there, it's an incredibly powerful book. It can be read in one sitting. It must have been a very difficult book to translate to get the nuances, because there are the nuances. And when I talk about the nuances, it's like we've mentioned that the sort of not the absence, but the the sort of I not isolation either, but there's an absence. They're not completely absent, men. They are there. Uh, the suggestion of them are there. And of course, it's very much they are the armed conflict and you know, there are refer references like the red bandana and the black boots and then a reference like the man in green uh, and red in a speedboat or uh, the G genus sons being taken by the gorilla and then gunshots in the distance it's a long way off yet and that kind of things so you mean you get those and if you're not watching for those they could you could miss them but that's part of the idea as well and I think that makes it quite powerful on that level. There's one further reference, and then we'll get into your your extract, uh, Annie. Uh, they do stay at, at the Encanto Hostel. Do, did Lorena have artistic license and try and make the the comparison with the famous Disney movie? Oh, I don't know. Um, <laughs> what? <laughs> I mean, I feel like definitely some license in the naming of the Encanto Hostel, but what's, um, I don't even know of the famous Disney movie. With oh, wow. Well, well, I have not watched it. My sons have watched it several times, uh -huh. but it's all about the mysticism of Colombia. It's a Disney movie and it brings it out. And and actually, the you know, the conflict is 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 suggested in it as well. Uh, but at the same time, it's it, there's a magical realism to it. And it's the film's called Encanto. And I just maybe, just yeah. maybe she's suggesting a counterweight to that kind of almost idealized Disney movie to this wound full of fish. But I, I don't know, maybe that's my license. Or maybe I'm being overwhelmingly pretentious. Uh, maybe <laughs> there is an Encanto hostel in that region. Uh, who knows? I mean, because I, some of this, I know that uh, Lorena Salazar grew up in Kibdo. She has to have mm -hmm. known the river. She has to have known these towns. And much of this must be drawn from, you know, from memory, of course. You know, you base a lot of this on what's going on. So, I mean, I'll leave it to you, readers, uh, whether you want it to be a, <laughs> a reference <laughs> to the Disney movie or not. Please don't let me uh, lighten <laughs> the nature of this book. So, Annie, you're going to read us a, a short extract as we bring this to a close. What have you chosen from your translation to read? Okay, so I'm going to read, I'm going to read from the opening, I'm going to read the very beginning and then just jump forwards a little bit. 
um till when they've till when they're boarding the boat just to kind of give a sense of the river and the sense of the relationship between this woman and her son um perfect and the sense of this sort of luscious luscious (laughs) prose um okay yeah this is from the beginning of the book the boy and i arrive at the dock in kibdo we're looking for a canoe that will take us both plus the soft toy penguin he's been carrying since we left home to Bella Vista. We sit on the concrete steps that lead to the Atrato River. I buy him a mango with lime and salt from a woman nearby and we wait. Mornings belong to the birds. They sing from the trees along the bank, even the youngest with nests of bald headed chicks, starving and defenseless. Look ma, a birdie, he says. It's not a birdie, it's a vulture, I tell him, my mouth full of mango. The turkey vulture perches on a rubbish bag. I don't want to explain to the boy the difference between that ominous creature and a birdie, and he doesn't ask. The animal takes flight, and the current sweeps the bag down the river. The town begins on the river's right bank and spreads into a jungle that makes it pay, resisting the invasion and reclaiming its space by filling the walls with damp and mold. In Kibdo, the atrato smells of salt fish, oranges and wet wood. Cutting deep through the land, watched over by rickety old houses, kept company by women and children who wash clothes on its bank. This is the river in its infancy. It's born in Carmen de Atrato and meets its end in the Caribbean Sea. The townspeople live off it, fishing, sailing along it and singing, or praying to its waters a thick fleshy arm of black earth. And then I'm just gonna skip forward a little bit when they're, when the woman and her son are boarding the canoe. The captain looks at him and tells him to jump, that there's no need to be scared, that she'll catch him. I take hold of the lime-shaped charm at my neck and kiss it. As soon as he sees me, the boy knows he can jump. That charm is a sign he invented one night, completely sure of himself. Ma, whenever you have the line between your teeth, it means you're saying yes to everything. Children make unbreakable rules. As for me, I submit to his law. In return, I ask him to do his homework before going out to play, preparing him for a life full of trade-offs. We educate each other. I teach him to become and he helps me to come undone, to live in new ways, following signs nobody else would understand. He's with me. I didn't give birth to him. I'm his mother and I always will be, however far he strays. That's what I tell myself every night in a prayer to let him go. As we stand facing the canoe, I want to tell him not to jump, that we'll go home instead and switch on the TV, that I need him. I smile and his right hand lets go of my dress, leaving it covered in creases. A one and a two and a three, he yells, then leaps and the captain catches him. Your turn, Ma. Jump onto the boat or plunge into the current. The boy thinks I'm about to jump onto the boat. He sounds happy, festive. It's a game. The shadow of jumping is plunging headlong, an act of complete surrender. I plunge headlong, pretending I'm just jumping, and the boy hugs me like when he comes home from school. I smooth his shirt with my hands and we sit on the wooden bench the captain points us towards. It's white with no backrest. If this were a tiny aeroplane, I'd say we were in seats 2B and 2C. The captain steers from the back. Unlike the times when we've travelled by plane, neither she nor her helper, a young guy who's just jumped onto the canoe himself, seems surprised that my son is black and I'm white. There you go. Perfect. Thank you so much. And that sets the scene as well for everybody to go out and buy the book. Um, <laughs> it's. I imagine it's available in all good bookstores and, of course, online at the usual uh, places. Annie, if there are people out here who are looking to have things translated, how can they get in touch with you? Um, Do you have a website? How can they? Um, <laughs> I actually don't have a website, which is absurd. Um, they can... They can Twitter? email me. Um, okay. No, I'm on Twitter. I'm on Twitter. Okay, so what's your Twitter, Twitter handle? It's um, Annie L M C D. M C D. There you go, Annie L M C D. 
Uh, I can't yeah. promise you uh, future work, but maybe, just maybe, someone out knows, there will go, wow, you know, future <laughs> things have happened, I think. Um, let me take this moment to say thank you so much. You've really you captured a lot of things and you've taken me back as well to the days of when I had to do literary criticism <laughs> at university. <laughs> and so for that, it was really enjoyable. Uh, and, and you've given us a little bit of an insight in what it's like to translate, because it's not an easy job trying to get someone else's words across into another language. Yeah, it's true. It's it's fascinating and difficult and a lot of fun and very satisfying every I time. It never so. gets old speaking to somebody who's read a book that I've translated and actually sort of experienced it the way I was hoping someone would. So oh, thank you oh. as well. Really no, nice. I, I enjoyed it. I will read it again, uh, you know, uh, more you know and take more time i obviously read it very rapidly but the you know rapidly and hopefully got got the gist of things and, and so on but i can genuinely recommend it out there i mean if i if i if i didn't like it i wouldn't recommend it that's the truth so <laughs> do check out uh the new book by it's her it's her debut novel isn't it uh Lorena it is yeah and she's very young she's younger than me which is always unfortunate for a translator oh, which means she's younger than me and everyone's younger <laughs> than me now <laughs> so yeah. do check it out this wound full of fish by Lorena yeah. Salazar Maso and of course you can find it in Spanish but of course you can find it in English online let me take this moment to say thank you so much to Annie McDermott for taking the time out of her day in the south of France <laughs> very nice um and well please well hopefully this brings you back to listening to the podcast once again i know you're not in colombia but hopefully this this will entice you to to listen to the podcast and maybe return to colombia in the future definitely thank definitely you very will. much for listening uh we'll go over and have some messages from our sponsors but at the same time if you feel that that, you, that, it, that you, this is worthwhile please take a look at our patreon page that's www.patreon.com forward slash columbia calling and you can leave you know what amounts to a tip or a little bit more for the columbia calling podcast and help us maintain uh you know viability but anyway this has been episode 470 now over to some messages from our sponsors. Thank you very much for listening, everyone, and bye-bye.